All right, thanks a lot. So before we dive in, do we have any public comment on items not on the agenda? All right, seeing none, our first presenter is Jeremiah. Good morning, this is Ashley Bohr with Jeremiah Peterson from the Sheriff's Office. Um, we are requesting commissioner signatures on the MOU to establish the Five Valleys Drug Task Force. It is pretty much the same MOU we've had for the past several years. It's a continuation um, funding through the Montana Board of Crime Control. Do you okay. have any questions? Yeah, Ashley, this is uh, Juanita Vero. Um, and I was just kind of wondering why Powell and Sanders aren't included in this too. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the task force. Yeah, we've had, um, actually a couple of years ago, we added Granite County. Um, we occasionally work with Sanders County um, and, and occasionally also with Flathead County. Um, for the purposes of the grant, the Montana Board of Crime Control requires at least five counties um, and then a tribe counts as a county. Uh, so we've just kind of worked with what we've had closest to us, like I said, for the past several years. And then the, this is Jeremiah Juanita. Um, the other reason is, so the counties that are neighboring us um, are part of our task force. Sanders County is part of the Northwest Drug Task Force, which is stationed out of Kalispell. And Powell oh. County is part of the task force, uh, I think it's Southwest, and that's stationed out of Butte. So it's not that we don't do stuff in those counties, it's just we try and, and use the geographic ones that are closest just for uh, ease of resources. So, um, you know, like Lake County is part of ours, but they also are part of uh, the Northwest out of Kalispell. So they're kind of a joint. Um, and then Granite County was part of Southwest out of Butte for a long time. Uh, a couple years ago, they came to us. They didn't feel like they were getting uh, much attention from those folks. And so that's why they wanted to join ours. Got it. Thank you so much for explaining that. You Could you um, uh, describe just a little bit uh, for folks who are on the line who might not know what some of the activities or uh, 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 particular uh, uh, goals are of the drug task force? So the main the main uh, goal of HIDA, which is the high intensity drug trafficking area, is to identify uh, what's called DTOs or drug trafficking organizations. And we want to identify those and dismantle them. And that, that's right from Rocky Mountain High to out of Denver. Um, and, and we just use the resources, the joint resources uh, from the city of Missoula County. Uh, we have state folks and then we have several uh, federal partners that, that all work in uh, one building together um, in order to identify, you know, those, those drug trafficking organizations and, and again, try to dismantle them. And we do that. Uh, throughout Missoula County and then the surrounding counties. And we also will go outside of the state of Montana to do that as well. To further that mission, the HIDA mission, um, we use the funding from the Montana Board of Crime Control to fund here locally two of our drug detectives out of Missoula County uh, Sheriff's Office. So that's what this um, grant directly pays for. Great, thanks. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, okay. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. Nope. It's all you want. <laughs> okay. I was going to, um, I uh, moved to approve that uh, Slotnick signed the renewal of the MOU. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. It's done. Thanks for joining us this morning, guys. Thank you so much. We thank appreciate you very it. much. You bet. All right, Deb, you're up next. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, great, thanks. Um, so what's next on the agenda is a contract um, for requesting signature for a contract for Mountain View Sales and Contracting LLC. They were the successful bidder for the Lewis and Clark septic tank replacement project that we've been working on for uh, several years now to replace the existing um, self-sealed septic tank that is currently servicing uh, the 
uh, community of Lewis and Clark Trailer Court in Clinton, Montana. So we put that out for bid. Um, bids came in and Mountain View was successful. They are, their contract amount is for $94,031. Um, we do have a DNRC grant for $125,000 to help assist us to pay for this. Um, the RSID itself is putting up $8,500 to help cover the additional costs for this, the engineering and everything. So um, we have a small pad of about $2,000 in the budget. Hopefully we won't need it, but um, we're very lucky that with some creative engineering and thinking outside the box, we are going to make this work. So before you today is our request to sign the contract. Great. Any Dad, do, 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 can you remind us about how many households are, are, are in the Lewis and Clark wastewater RSID? Uh, I think at last count, there was, there was one that was recently removed, but uh, the service is still there. It's close to 40, 41. Okay. And are the, are the costs of this for the RSID going to be spread out over time? Uh, we actually had, we'd been scrimping and saving, and so we have that cash balance. Oh, it's great. So this isn't going to have a, a monthly effect on anybody? No, sir. Not oh, really. that's so great, Ted. Well done. Thank you. Okay. It's yeah, a lot that's... of planning, a lot of, a lot of elbow grease, but we get it, we're getting it done. <laughs> Way to go. Good to see this move forward. So I would move that we authorize the chair to sign the contract. Second. Glad it's happening. Yeah, way, way to go. All in favor. Aye. Uh, well, this is the proposed contract, right? Or what? what's, is this the contract? Are we, are we, is this happening now or is there another? It was proposed until uh, 30 seconds Just, ago. Now, now it's. <laughs> now it's happening. Now it's real. <laughs> Finally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and up next we have the indomitable, Andrew Chorney. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Hey, how you doing, Andrew? Ah, uh, you know, every day is a challenge, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just at your direction, uh, you would asked me to look at ways to cut costs and make uh, government more accessible for the citizens of Missoula. One way we looked at, at uh, reducing costs and making government services more accessible was by eliminating the chargeback on credit card fees uh, that the citizens were paying to pay either their property taxes or any fees or services uh, from the county of Missoula. We instituted the chargeback program a number of years ago, Vicki and I did, because uh, we were having a number of people come in and pay very large property tax bills, large landowners, hundred thousand plus dollar bills with their uh, credit cards and the credit cards provided for vacation miles and other things and there we were experiencing somewhere in excess of six hundred thousand dollars a year in the county paying these credit card fees for these credit card users to help them vacation uh, and that that really was at the expense of the others who were paying with cash and uh, so we were seeing, seeing a shortfall when you're a retail business, you can absorb those costs by putting them into the cost of the products you sell. As a, as a taxing jurisdiction, we have no alternative except to pay those fees. We can't, we can't raise taxes for somebody else or for them to recapture them. So we had to put the charge back on. Uh, and what, because of the COVID-19 virus and our shelter in place and all the other constraints, We'd like to encourage people to stay at home and be able to use their credit cards to pay for property taxes and other such items. So what I did is uh, Michelle Denman and I negotiated a deal with uh, Montana Interactive, our credit card processor, uh, to eliminate for the county to absorb those fees up to the $3,000 limit. In my opinion, that would take care of most of the most of Missoula County. Uh, a person would be able to pay their second half taxes on a house with a market value between uh, $460,000 and $475,000, um, depending where in Missoula they live. Um, so that really takes care of the majority of Missoula and, and certainly to be able to pay all their fees and other things within the county 
with the credit cards at, at no cost. We would like to do this as a temporary program uh, through July or through June 30th with the option of extending it. Our anticipation is it would cost the county approximately 40000 40 to $45,000 in that period of time. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's a good service and well, uh, well done to the commissioners for proposing such a service to the citizens of Missoula. Yeah, this is great. Uh, thank you. I've <clears throat> uh, not infrequently as of late asked what is Missoula County doing to help uh, mitigate the uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and that includes uh, financial impacts and I think this is uh, this is a great creative example of one of the things in our suite of tools that we're able to offer the citizens of Missoula County. Yeah, there. I agree. There are things we've been able to do big and small. This is on the smaller side, but it'll really matter when people are paying those bills. Yeah, and it, and it allows them to stay at home and not leave their homes and be able to. For pay. sure. And, yeah, and so I think it accomplishes a couple of the objectives. Nice job, Andrew and nice Michelle. Nice job, Andrew and Michelle. <laughs> yeah, good, good work. Um, then I, oh, I've lost my language, but I moved to, hold on here, sorry. I move uh, that we direct staff to temporarily suspend the collection of credit card user fees when paying for county services or property taxes through June 30th. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Thanks, you. Andrew. All right. Next, we have a looks like a, a standard employment agreement at partnership. Yes, the ever controversial standard employment. <laughs> and this, this item has been postponed oh, for today. Oh. It, will, it will come back at another meeting. It's controversial. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Great. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk correspondence. Who would like to lead this discussion on on this letter to the letter that Tyler is going to deal with? Letter to Tyler. So, commissioners, I can speak to that. Um, Vicky and I drafted this letter uh, for you based on your conversations uh, at your yeah. admin meeting on Tuesday. Uh, it's a request to the elected treasurer, Tyler Grenant, to delay the uh, billing of mobile homes and personal property taxes in Missoula County um, it all, until July 1st. It also gives you the ability to notify him by June 15th if you believe that date needs to be extended. And so this would apply to just those two pieces, mobile homes and personal property. And, and if and understand it right, Chris, the, uh, there's a billing date, but then the, the money isn't due for a fault for another month. Is that correct? There's a 30 day right window in which people have to pay once they receive the bill. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think, I think our understanding is that there will not be a significant um, burden placed on taxing jurisdictions to, to cover this delay in in billing which is the reason why we're contemplating it if if there had been uh, that would have been a problem yeah we if i remember right we did take a look at how this would affect the school districts especially some of the smaller school districts and it looked like it uh, was going to be a relatively benign effect and that uh, we could handle this for a couple months and this could help folks who are living in mobile homes and help some of the businesses who otherwise would pay a considerable chunk out because of the gear they need for their businesses. Yeah, and this uh, this is in the same vein as our previous action in terms of temporary suspension of credit card user fees just to recognize that folks are in a tight spot right now and uh, this is what we can do while also recognizing that the way that we're able to deliver the services that we do deliver are through taxes. So uh, uh, we we still need revenue in order to do what is essential for Missoula County. Um, so yeah, I'm supportive of signing this. Yep, absolutely. Um, I don't know, does Andrew have anything to add to this? You know, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I think uh, combined the mobile homes and uh, the uh, 
personal property amount to something less than nine hundred thousand dollars in total for all the taxing jurisdictions. So I think uh, for Sunset School, one that we were worried about, it was about four hundred dollars. So it was a minimal amount of money. Uh, Michelle, am I correct in what I'm saying? Am I anywhere close to the mark? Um, you're pretty. You're um, you're very close, Andrew. In considering that, you know the the revenue that we would be um, pushing out of this fiscal year is just the first half. So your numbers are very very close. Okay. Well, see, I'm not losing my memory. Okay. Good. Good, good job, Andrew. <laughs> and uh, and uh -oh. one other, I guess, related piece of correspondence that just came in. We got a letter yesterday, late yesterday, from. Representative Zach Brown, um, and and I think there's there's been some bit of confusion as far as Missoula County um, relative to uh, to taxes and and delaying billing. Uh, this and I think some of this has spun out of uh, some recent media coverage. Uh, what we're contemplating is exactly what we're doing today relative to mobile homes and personal property. We recognize full well that uh, it would take an action on the part of either the legislature or the governor through his emergency powers to do anything relative to property tax, real property tax, I should say. And there are uh, significant ramifications to that unless the state provides mitigations to local government because we are so heavily reliant on property taxes, real property taxes. Yeah, I just, I'm going to second what Dave is saying. What we're contemplating here in this uh, in this letter delaying billing on mobile homes and personal property is as far as we can go. And this is this is the end of our our jurisdiction, so to speak. It's also, I feel like, kind of the end of what we could financially absorb in terms of delaying payments and still be able to provide the services that uh, our economy and our social well-being depend upon. Those are great clarifying comments, commissioners. Thank you. All right, so we're all we're all in on signing this letter to Tyler. Yep. Thank you great. so much. Yeah. Well done again. Thanks. Okay. How about this? Uh, these letters uh, supporting the stimulus package. So Andrew, yeah. Andrew they, and Dave, they were. So yeah, really well written, and thank you guys for doing that. Yeah, really, really, really well done. I thought they were thoughtful and, and detailed. Yeah, that's all, all Andrew there, uh, and and this is ratifying letters that we uh, sent out a couple of days ago because they were somewhat time sensitive, given the fact that Congress, as we speak, is looking at a fourth stimulus bill. And it, it seems to be moving along now fairly quickly. I received an email forwarded to me by Dave last night uh, from NAPO where they had a questionnaire asking about lost revenue in, in addition to other items that we may now be able to seek uh, uh, financial reimbursement for. And they're talking about local economies. And so I, I've been focusing on direct costs related to uh, COVID-19 expenses after March 1st that were unbudgeted for that perhaps we could ask the state for reimbursement out of their 1.25 billion which they have absolute control over and we have very limited ability to access that money but this fourth stimulus package um, it, it may provide some much re needed relief for uh, jurisdictions with populations of less than 500,000 people uh, which we've been excluded from in this first stimulus package, or it's the third stimulus package, I'm sorry. Yeah, great work, Andrew. Uh, that was a really, it really was. Yeah. Thank and you. This is, this is getting FedEx today, or like, what? what's the, the timing of this? Is there an issue about that? I think the, some of the letters were emailed, and then the ones to the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader, I believe, were Federal Express. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, I've asked um, the the letters that are published on the website are um, the draft versions. I've actually asked Annie to republish the the um, replace those attachments with the final signed version, so that those are the ones that are on the agenda portal. 
Um, so that's a note to media on the crawl as well. So those final signed documents, those letters will be on our portal in a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I have already done that. Good. I'm, I'm going to encourage our media to take a look at these letters because they're really good. Thanks, Annie. Um, Is up. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Juan. Uh, I was just thinking of the fourth stimulus, um, the letter we got from Anna Peterson about supporting LWCF or full funding for LWCF and kind of what we wanted to do with that. Um, just sign on to it and is there anything to add to that? I need to look at it more closely, Juanita. Um, uh, I'm absolutely supportive of uh, LWCF. Uh, if, if it's uh, just a kind of an individual elected official sign on letter, any of us can just go ahead and do that uh, as opposed to, I mean, uh, are they looking for from the commission as a whole or just looking for individuals? Um, I think from the commission as a whole, because they're asking for, you know, letterhead and that sort of thing. Oh, I see. It's, and so I just want to, we'll look at it again and, and see how you guys feel about it and go from there. Then there was also a request for an op-ed, but uh, I think like you said, we've, we've had some op-eds recently and this might not be, we don't want to be hogging all the space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is still an important issue. Well, so. I, unless the uh, the Missoulian or uh, current wants to just offer us a weekly uh, column, then we'll have plenty of space. Uh, for so. <laughs> um, We'd be happy but, to do that. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> acre. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah. can't make any promise. Okay, but full funding of LWCF is important, and and um, yeah, I feel like yeah, we're all. Yeah. In I'm 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 all, I'm all in on supporting it. I, I haven't seen this, had a chance to see this letter, but I, if it is what I'd imagine, it's hard to not want to see this funded. Likewise, likewise. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we're on to discussion items. Uh, is Adrian on the line? I am. Good morning, would commissioners. You, thanks. Would you like to lead us through this one? Sure. Um, so just a little bit of background, uh, you know, we have a new acronym for you to uh, to digest from FEMA. How exciting. Yes, right. So um, as, as the, the, the COVID pan pandemic has been um, kind of unfolding in the United States, FEMA has tried to position themselves to be nimble and uh, invent new ways to help communities respond to that um, through some federal programs, one of which is this non-congregate sheltering concept um, obviously, when we have individuals um, sheltered in a congregate setting, the social distancing requirements and the, just the ability for community spread of, of the disease is high. And so this notion of being able to create these emergency non-congregate shelters is something that was high on their priority list. Um, it was high on our priority list. We recognized the need very early in mid-March, actually started working with the state and FEMA to, to try to figure out how we could um, implement something like that in Missoula County. And so, I mean, to date, just as a just as a um, a proof of need, I suppose, to date, we have uh, we have had a an immediate need to provide shelter for uh, twenty five individuals who kind of fit into the categories that are eligible for this non-congregate sheltering. And so we have uh, requested, authorization from FEMA and from the state to implement a non-congregate shelter in Missoula County. Um, and there, there really are three categories of, of individuals that um, kind of are, um, are identified as the population needing this service. So those are um, those that have tested positive for COVID-19 that do not require hospitalization but need isolation or quarantine facilities. Um, and that includes people who may have been hospitalized but don't necessarily need to stay in the hospital any longer, um, but need a place to go um, having been discharged from the hospital while they're still in that positive state. Uh, the second category is those who have been exposed to COVID-19 um, 
and they just need a place, but they don't, we, it's not appropriate to send them to the hospital, um, but they also need a place to quarantine, um, awaiting either becoming positive or um, going through that quarantine period where they are assured that they did not contract the disease. And then the final category is those individuals that are considered to be high risk, uh, which is classified as people over 65 with underlying health conditions where um, a congregate shelter setting is just not appropriate for them based on their high risk. And so um, through somewhat of a, of a lengthy kind of back and forth and making sure we um, identified all the gray areas that, that FEMA has, is, they're trying to work through this too, uh, we believe that we have kind of come to a plan um, that is uh, acceptable to FEMA and that uh, will allow us to kind of meet this, this need within our community. So before I go on, is there kind of questions about kind of the concept of non-congregate sheltering? No, that no? makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's great. And so the next the next kind of big hurdle for us was to figure out where we do this, how we do this, and and so in in conversations with uh, with with the city of Missoula, um, having something in the city. Um, close to hospital facilities, close to uh, other support networks that, that would be necessary. Um, we looked at lots of different opportunities, lots of different options. And as we look at what other jurisdictions are doing in the state, uh, it, it's across the board. Um, you know, renting out of hotel rooms is, is pretty costly. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's challenging when uh, we are renting out the facility for a very specific use, but not really in control of the facility. And it's a vulnerable position for us to be in, in that it it uh, doesn't doesn't allow us to be as nimble as we think we might need to be. I mean, if, for example, all of a sudden tomorrow we had 20 individuals that needed this service, uh, finding 20 individual ho hotel rooms may be a challenge for us, as well as very costly. And so we, we quickly looked at, uh, were, were there any... Uh, facilities that were in government control that, that would allow us kind of maximum flexibility. And having none, uh, we looked at then the opportunity for anything that um, could uh, could meet that need. And, and, and as you're aware, the city is uh, looking at acquisition of the Sleepy Inn as, as a potential for, for this purpose. And so looking at what that could look like is that if the city owned it and then were able to kind of lease it to the county for us to, to carry out this mission, it seems a little awkward to have the city then lease it to the county. But when you think about how FEMA funding works and, and the county being an applicant agent and, and the Office of Emergency Management, Management being identified as that applicant agent, it kind of starts to make a little bit of sense, at least I hope. But if there's questions about that, please, please ask. So, Adrian, that means the, uh, the the costs we incur in terms of lease and, and other operational costs are reimbursable by FEMA? Correct. And so, you know, I mean, obviously, we don't ever want to be doing things just because they're reimbursable, but we are looking at how we can do this in a financially responsible way to maximize not only our, uh, our, our needs, but also our ability to, to recoup costs that are eligible. Absolutely. That's kind of where I was headed. That we, this is a this allows us to solve a problem and get reimbursed. We're not doing this just for the joy of reimbursement, but because of the problem needs to be solved, and we this will allow us to solve the problem without putting it on the backs of Missoula County's taxpayers. Absolutely. Yes. Adrian, so uh, when it comes to reimbursement, are we talking the the seventy five percent, twenty five percent percent split between FEMA and local government, or is it something else? So it, it is actually something else. That is the bright spot here and that if you will recall a couple of weeks ago, the governor did issue a directive that uh, that essentially said that local governments would not need to uh, do an issuance of their emergency two mil. What that does um, is that that essentially puts the state on the hook for that 25%. Um, I haven't seen all of the nuances of how that's going to work, but in concept, that is kind of what, what that means. That, FEMA will pick up 75% of the tab, and that remaining 25% that would have otherwise been local match uh, would be picked up uh, under the state's share. That's great. Yeah, I think I missed that bright spot. So that's a that's, that's really a, that's yeah. a true bright spot. 
It is. So when we look at um, when we look at not only kind of just the the, the the leasing of the facility for this particular purpose, but then also there will be substantial operating costs because because it will be a you know quote unquote government facility. Uh, we won't have necessarily a, a hotel staff or um, or those kinds of things that would be kind of rolled into that nightly room rate. We'll, we will have to figure out how to um, how to stand that up as as a government kind of run. Operation. And and so those costs associated with the the operation of the facility, the utilities of the facility, as well as you know laundry service and and food, um, those are the types of things that would be funneled through our office as eligible costs. And and are those operational decisions? Are those still in process? We're still, uh, you know, I mean, this this whole um, incident has been a case of building the ship as we're we're trying to sail. Yeah. But um, but we we feel like we have a pretty good path forward. We have a lot of bright, smart people around the table trying to figure out what this all looks like. But admittedly, we are not um, hotel operators, and so we're we're trying to lean into to folks that maybe know a little bit more about those kind of operations, as well as how to best support uh, the individuals that we think will um, be occupying facilities. It just probably already goes without saying, but are we taking advantage of the expertise we have with the homeless population in the form of Aaron Peehan and Teresa Williams and Amy from the POV? Yes. Great, great. And and I don't know how this would uh, would play out in practice here, but if if we're in the position of needing to hire folks to do hotel operation like functions whether that's room cleaning or anything else i would love to see us be able to provide folks a living wage who are doing this work for us yes uh, uh, agreed um we're we're going to need to provide kind of 24 uh 7 operational services and uh, we do not currently have the staff to do that we will have to hire staff um, and, and that is currently what we're we're looking at is is what type of staff do we need, what the functions that they need to perform, what kind of supervision and management do they need? Um, yeah, I mean, we're 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 trying to be very thoughtful about how we can be successful, um, and there's a lot of moving parts to that. Adrian, how how best can we kind of be kept up to date on the discussions around the operation of this facility? I think we can. Um, so uh, currently, uh, I think the MRA board is going to meet today um, as far as the, the acquisition piece of that. And then city council is, has a meeting on the 21st, I believe, uh, with a closing date soon there to follow. We can't, we can't do anything as far as um, kind of starting to occupy the facility until all of those boxes have been checked. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking at the end of the month. Right. Currently, FEMA... Currently, FEMA... Um, authorizes non-congregate sheltering operations on a 30-day uh, window. So um, the current 30-day window for non-congregate sheltering is approved till May 10th. We have every expectation that that will be extended for another 30 days, but uh, we will always be in this 30-day operational period of, of approval for the operations that we're doing. Um, that's not really answering your question. I think that we could absolutely schedule kind of routine uh, meetings and check-ins uh, as as we're kind of developing the plan, but then also going forward once we've executed. I, I would I would love it if we could be in on some of the development conversations. That would be really great, given that this is such a big deal. Yeah, we can we can figure out that absolutely. Whoever the thank best, you, uh, thanks a lot. I, from three of you, um, we can certainly. Um, start including you in some of our planning processes. Great, and that's and and I'm just saying that because I imagine at some point we're, we have to sign some type of MOU with the city. Yeah, and I don't know who else is on the, the line that may be able to speak to that, but we're working with not only very closely in lockstep with the health department because all of this is is based on a, a health officer's order, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, are, yep. we are doing this because there is a significant uh, public health and safety risk um, and, and trying to control the spread within Missoula County. Um, so it's not just on a whim. So, uh, For sure. Very involved in kind of the the development of that, as is the county attorney's office working closely with the city, so that we end up with an agreement that um, that works for all parties. Uh, you know, I mean, it, this is this is truly a collaborative.
thing between the city and the county and and so the development of that lease agreement uh, is just going to require a lot of coordination and, and cooperation I imagine there's some CDC guidelines around non congregate shelter is that correct yeah there are um, there are guidelines abound <laughs> but yes CDC uh, guidelines uh, so again we're relying kind of on the the health department to, to help us digest and, and interpret those but then also the the FEMA guidelines um, that will be bound to as well and I suspect one of the areas we'll want to have some involvement and input on would be the development of any security plan for the facility. Sure. I mean, it, it, it goes without saying that um, we are going to have to have a security plan for this for this facility, not only not only because we're doing this from a community protection standpoint, but also protecting the individuals that would be residing there. Adrian, are, are hospitals right now under a different level of security than they typically are? Uh, I, I can't speak to community, but St. Pat's is, is maintaining the, the level of security that they that they do um, through routine business. I don't know that it's been expanded or in height or heightened. In OK, anything. OK. Um, yeah. And, and I will say, you know, I mean, that is one of the, the partners that is at the table with this discussion in that um, the last thing that we want to do is be flooding the hospital with individuals that don't need to be at the hospital simply because they're in this isolation or quarantine situation. This, this facility is not designed to be any kind of medical care facility um, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. We don't have the capacity for that. And, and in fact, um, is pretty explicit in that it is not intended for that purpose. It really is a, in an effort to, to further help protect our hospitals so that these individuals that may not have anywhere else to go don't end up ha having to be at the hospital. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else on the line who has questions or comments or needs clarifications? OK. <laughs> I guess I will I will add one other point. Um, and while while the uh, the focus for for us will be on um, on this non congregate sheltering operation that we've just discussed, we're, we also have have kind of tried to excuse me incorporate into our plan uh, maximum flexibility uh, with the understanding that we will um, inevitably as this thing unfolds over time there may be um, needs to provide non-congregate sheltering to other populations uh, such as healthcare workers who may have been exposed who do not necessarily want to go home and expose their families or first responders who may have been exposed to someone awaiting a test and so uh, we've, we've built that into our plan as well so that we do have some flexibility around that. Great. Thanks a lot for all that info Adrian. And for yeah, really making this super complicated thing happen. Super needed and complicated. <laughs> it, it has yeah. been, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it has caused us to stretch our imagination in ways that we haven't had to in the past. So thank you for that. Way to be proactive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Dave, do you want to talk about historical documentation? Well, and I, I think we actually may have, uh, hopefully, uh, Matt Watsonheiser on the line. Are oh, you excellent. That's great. Yeah, I'm here, Dave. So, sorry about that, Matt. I'm no, glad you're here. Okay. Thanks no. for joining us. No, good morning, commissioners, and great to see you guys all well and uh, hanging in there today. So um, I just wanted to kind of give you an update. You probably heard through the grapevine that we're doing a, a documentation project. Uh, you know, obviously we're living through kind of a watershed moment in American history. I mean, I think back to some of the things that have happened in my lifetime, I think of the Challenger disaster and 9-11, and this is very quickly becoming one of those moments. So about three weeks ago, Dave reached out to me and had the idea of documenting this from a historical perspective and creating or eventually creating an archive uh, that would be available to both historians, government officials, and other folks uh, when they're looking to, to do research and to study this period of time. So we've started to put together a group um, 
we've got a number of great partners right now and we've actually come up with the name the uh, documenting COVID-19 in Missoula County, a community archive project. Uh, some of our partners that we're working with, it's a joint city county. We've also engaged the University of Montana and some of the folks in the history department. Uh, we've also engaged uh, Donna McRae over at the Mansfield Archives, and she's been incredibly helpful with, the, with this. Uh, and then our most recent partner is the Missoula Downtown Association, which has a group called Heritage Missoula. And this is a group that's working on the downtown interpretive plan. Uh, and they're engaged to help us reach out to our local businesses, nonprofits, and folks like that. Uh, from outside of the city of Missoula, we've gotten folks involved from Sealy, Swan, um, and a number of other folks as well, too. So it's we're trying to capture this uh, from a county perspective. Um, we're currently getting ready to do some press. We've got a landing page that's just about done that'll provide information for the community on this project. We also will have a link on that where it'll go to a forum where folks in the community can share their experiences and the ways that they're dealing with this and the impacts of the COVID crisis on them through that link as well too. Um, the idea is that the type of information we're gonna collect is everything from emails to memos to meeting notes. Uh, we hope to collect oral histories, um, all sorts of different things, anything related to this crisis and how our community is rallying to deal with it. Um, it's It's been an exciting project. It's not something historians are used to doing. We're used to documenting things that happened years ago, not creating an organization and documenting in the moment. But um, like I said, it's been challenging, but at the same time, it's I think it's really important. And, and I appreciate Dave recognizing that early enough that we could start getting this thing up and running. Um, Matt, and I wanted Matt, to, do you know, sure. Oh, Say, Matt, do you know if similar things were done on a local level, like during World War II or during the Great Depression? I don't. I know, um, actually, the best person to speak with about this would probably be Ellen Leahy, who wrote an excellent article on the 1918 flu. Uh, but it's, as a historian, it's always frustrating because a lot of things don't get saved and we're kind of mm -hmm. stuck picking and choosing and, you know, you get kind of a, a mix and match. I, Josh, what I can speak to is, doing research on the, the Alien Detention Center at Fort Missoula, we're really lacking a lot of the basic documents, the, mm. the things at the camp, the daily records of who was doing what and what they were ordering and, and all those type of things. So those are all missing and that's a big hole we have in doing that research. So I guess we're using those lessons we've learned to try to collect those types of things moving forward. Great. It must be interesting to have so much information to kind of yeah. like I, I would I mean so glad you guys are doing this but yeah. what a yeah. wild time to be trying to put together um, this sort of project with so much available information. Yeah. Well and and and, not, and this is actually uh, what occurred to me is is exactly the time that we ought to be doing it uh, as Matt mentioned what more often than not it's it's way after the fact and sometimes significantly after the fact that uh we're looking back on on trying to craft a, a narrative of, of what happened what went well what didn't go so well uh, we have the opportunity in real time to uh to jump on this and and help uh preserve the documentary record but also uh help uh, shape it by way of uh, informing folks who are collecting documents what they ought to be uh, hanging on to and what they ought not to be pitching in the, the circular file. Yeah, so Matt, what what do you, what sort of information do you want? <laughs> because there is so much yeah. out there. So I have to say we've kind of compartmentalized this uh, between the different organizations. Um, from my standpoint, what I'm collecting related to the county are meeting notes from some of our, our groups that have convened to help deal with the crisis. I do have to say that Adrian and Ann Hughes and uh, Chris Lounsbury and some of the other folks have been super supportive of the project uh, and really hope to open doors. But uh, so we're collecting those type of meeting notes. We're collecting uh, when you guys send emails out to the staff, we're collecting those things as well, too. Uh, we're archiving all the daily videos that have been done, so those will be preserved. Um, of course, all the governor's directives that he sent out, all the press releases that have been sent out. So it it is a pretty big volume of stuff. Uh, but I think what's really going to be valuable is 
you know, normally when you when you get things, when you do historical research, you'll get a mix of here and there, you get a summary after the fact. Being able to see how this thing is developed over the course of weeks and maybe months uh, will be really interesting. I mean, so you can kind of trace a discussion that started, you know, on March 13th, and you can trace how that develops. Um, I mean, I think of something like the, the non-congregate shelter and how that's been discussed and how we're moving forward on it. So I think it'll be really interesting down the road for other government officials or historians to be able to look and see how the county came up with this idea and then that idea moved from an idea to an actual action and then something that's benefiting the community. And, and I think what Matt and his team are involved with here is, is somewhat unique in that about three weeks ago or so when I had started thinking about this, what I was seeing happening across the nation was organizations such as museums or uh, other groups uh, wanting to figure out how to do the work that they always did in a virtual environment. Uh, so that, that's, that was the work of, uh, of public historians. Is how do you interpret stuff for the public in your museum virtually rather than doing it in person? So you had either that or folks focused on how do we capture stories, kind of uh, the community's experience in a, in a non-governmental way of, of COVID-19, but nobody was really looking uh, as near as I could tell in terms of what's the government response to this, such as uh, Missoula County, City of Missoula. And so I think by blending those things together uh, as, as Matt and his group are doing is is something that I hope will serve as a model for other communities across the country in terms of how do you spin up uh, a documentation effort for a significant, uh, historically significant event such as what we're experiencing today. Yep. Matt, is there a kind of social history side to this? Yes, I think that's where we're going to get with the oral histories, Josh, and the, uh, this opportunity for people to be able to submit their own stories as part of this. And I, I think that was one of the things that was really clarified because, you know, initially when Dave and I talked about it, it was more capturing how the government's responding to it. But in working with the folks at the university, it, you know, became apparent that we want to make sure this isn't a top down history, that this is yeah. incorporating everyday folks reactions as well, too. And so this uh, online submission form that's going to be up through the UM archives will allow people to, to go in and actually share their personal experiences, yeah. their responses. So I think it's going to it's going to be a really well-rounded picture of not just government, which is important, but also everyday folks and how they're dealing with this as well, too. That's that's great. I think you'll really be able to tell a complete story, yep. including all sides like that. Well, and I'm excited, too, because we're going to start doing a little bit of press today for it. Uh, we're finalizing our press release right now. Um, I'm going to do some stuff with KPAX later on today. Uh, we'll send out the press release and, and Ann Hughes has been gracious and agreeing to send it out from the county. I thought it was best to come from the county because that's where our community has become accustomed to getting their COVID-19 information at this point. So yeah. we'll do that. And I, uh, Kim Brigham also has been involved in the project and he's gonna get an article on the Missoulian probably tomorrow. So it's, you know, it'll be great once we get the word out to the public, then, you know, this link will be up and they can start to share their stories. And I think this thing will really take off. Great, Something, Good work. Something else to think about, um, in a similar vein is I would love to see all of our department heads start just jotting down some notes as far as how has their department and uh, their organizational unit within Missoula County uh, responded and adapted to this because I think that will be a pretty important record going forward in terms of how wh what do we need to do different to make ourselves more resilient to uh, events like this in the future so if uh, if folks think that's a good idea, I'd be happy to draft something for your review and maybe it could go out from the BCC to departments. Sounds good. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Thanks, yeah, thank guys. You, thank you for coming. Stay well. Yeah, you too, Matt. See you. See ya. All right. Do we have anything else? Hey, one, one question I have, uh, Josh, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any... Uh, of our members of the media still on the line here, but uh, I'd love to hear from folks in terms of how this, uh, how our electronic uh, virtual meeting platform is going. Uh, 
uh, admittedly, we're figuring this out as we go, but uh, it seems to be working from our end fairly well, but I don't know what folks' perspective is uh, outside there. Yeah, great question. Uh, this, is, this is Martin. I think it's going uh, fantastic. It's easy to track. Uh, generally can identify who's speaking. That's probably the hardest part, but, uh, and that's because I'm familiar with all of you, but uh, that may be the only hurdle. Hmm. This is uh, Patrick. I'm, uh, I'm, I think it's going well overall. Generally, my preference, though, is for uh, live stream videos, mainly because it's easier to identify who's speaking. We can, we can ask people to say their name before they start chatting. That'd be helpful, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's helpful. Feedback. And, and Patrick, just sorry, I, I want to make sure you see the link in the agendas, right, where you could be watching it live from your computer. Sorry, I did not. I'm actually, uh, I'm filling in for Cameron, so I'm, I'm used to only covering it uh, over the phone. Gotcha, because we, we do have live stream video that pops up who's speaking, um, which might be helpful too. Okay, well, thanks for uh, letting me know then. And that was Chris Lounsbury. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do, do we have other things we'd like to talk about that are COVID related? I have one item. This is Vicki Zire, and it is at the end of the month, you are supposed to have um, a meeting with Dan Clark. To yeah. Talk about um, other, uh, uh, other alternate forms of government and mm -hmm. all of that information that he shared with you back in <laughs> November, I think, of 2019. He can do it virtual. Great. He, but he also said he would be willing to postpone. He said it would be a little more difficult virtual rather than huh. having to sit down and have a meeting. And he would be willing to talk about come back late summer, early fall. How many people would the meeting consist of? Well, right now it was, I think uh, it would have been like your chief officers and yourselves and that's all. I wasn't going to have the full department heads at this one. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I feel like this is better a smaller conversation. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we just go for it. Uh, uh, not postpone. I don't know. I, what do I, you guys think? I, I, yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to go for it. I feel like we're going for everything else. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's keep the ball rolling. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to send him a Teams invite and see if that, or have Sarah send him a Teams invite. Perfect. He uh, talked about another platform. I'm going to see if he can't try to do the teams because okay. we're used to that. Yeah, thank you. Uh huh. I just wanted to get your feedback. So that's all I had today. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I feel like with that side of the group and we're familiar enough with each other getting frozen in weird positions and <laughs> stuttering our way through it that I think we could have a productive meeting. I think so. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Anything else out there in the our finding waning moments? Uh, I don't have anything. Great, thank you all. Um, I'm just going to jump off so I can get on this 11 o'clock one. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you.